Hello? Then speaking first, should I please? Here is second, should I please? CG? Oh, this is speaking first. Here is second, should I please? Uh, speaking first, uh, here are the ones. Dina speaking second, here please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, motion before the House uh, the House in countries with constitutional courts that helps to replace the Bill of Rights for a freestanding right to justice. Uh, if no one else has any, has any extra points or questions, we'll be forward to the end. We'll be forward to the Prime Minister to go with the case for solid. Yes. Right. So we'll, we'll uh, media has been set up a uh, video keeper, so we'll get us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is everyone ready? I want to begin this debate by answering what a right to justice is. I think generally this is a right to get giving each their due. It's a right to uphold society. It's a right to fairness in relation to the laws. I feel like that should be relatively uncontroversial what justice is. But what is a right to justice practically? I think it's three things. One, it's not just vibes. It's an evolving right that's integrated into the general fabric of the society. This means that probably has a degree of precedent, even if it isn't entirely beholden preference. I'm going to look towards like Dworkin's conception of a chain novel here in terms of the law, where it's an evolving story told by various legal rules. Rulings. A ruling might not deviate, but it might deviate from precedent, but it still exists in relation to precedent. It just also exists in relation to a general right. Second, I think it's like somewhat integrated into society and like the interests of the law and like what society holds, right? Like society's understanding of justice obviously varies over time. The right to justice probably varies. It's different now than it was in like the 1800s. However, it's still in the context of that precedent. Third and finally, I think this exists in relation to constitutional rights. I don't want to hear some like dumb arguments about how like there's not going to be like trade laws in the economy about this. There's probably some laws in like other parts of the world even if there's some controversial disputes um i think the principle like there's still present that exists it's just flexible to a degree i'll take a po in closing now um no i'll take one for you later okay um so I think like just principally, I think like the core sort of clash of this debate is going to be a comparative. Because I'm sure Ops gonna argue, like, ah, this right to justice could mean literally every anything. You could just pass like arbitrary laws to get stuff. I know that's the argument. But I think equally you have to answer the question of like how constitutional laws are not just gonna be so specific and so individually tailored as to prevent the application of justice in a society. And what we're going to show you is that based on how the constitution is written, it can equally be entirely arbitrary. But why is a right to justice general better as a general principle? I think one appeals to justice are just more likely to succeed in protecting the interests of citizens because they can operate in relation to precedent, precedent, but also like a social understanding. For example, like police brutality laws in the U.S. that are technically constitutional via qualified immunity, but obviously do not accord with society's gender understanding from justice. No, thank you. Um, the second is I think that the system disincentivizes arbitrariness. Ops' worst case portrayal is going to be like, ah, this is ridiculous because there could be like literally anything. But I think that you have to understand how this would work in like the real world world. Like courts would want to maintain a some amount of objectivity and precedent to allow things to work. That precedent is just going to be flexible in relation to society's understanding of justice and the value that we accord to that preference precedent will be existed in relation to both the precedent and the general theory of justice. Now, what are the substantive arguments as to why constitutional rights is bad? Because I'm sure ops can stand up here and promote like a very rosy picture of constitutional rights that it's like the freedoms of minorities are being trampled upon, but this part of the law says they have freedom of speech or whatever. I think it's not always the case for a few reasons. The first is that rights are fundamentally inflexible. They don't change over time. You can look at this in like gun laws in the US that are frankly absolutely ridiculous because they were written in the 1700s. This prevents society move from moving on and like adopting logical things. But equally, I think it, you can also institutionalize historical oppression because if you believe that people can like, like engage in like have like terrible views and you think that might be arbitrary in our current society, you have to recognize that constitutions like internalize and integrate into the law the terrible views of people 300 years ago, which are comparatively net worse than the views we hold today. And not only that, those views can't change. They are literally written into the law. 
I think like, like, yeah, like a racist status quo, Peter says the racist crash, which is what creates the constitution. But second, I think fundamentally that rights do not provide enough protection. Why is this the case? I think that rights are generally very inflexible. What this means is they apply to very specific things and they're very tailored. This allows gratuitous violations of these rights, given that the violation falls slightly outside the principle. For example, Jim Crow, like was obviously like very wrong, but did was technically legal via the specifics of the US constitution. Or another example, like burning draft cards. The way the first amendment is written is like very specific that like that does not count as freedom of speech in all specific cases. And it was only when it was revised in understanding of the theory of justice that did happen. But for the particular precedent which was used to disqualify it and the constitutional ruling in that case, which still exists today, no thank you, is that if it incites violence like burning draft cards does, it is not allowed under freedom of speech. I think the third reason, finally, is that rights lend themselves to sort of overly technical interpretation that is restrictive. Why is this the case? I think you have to recognize that the writing of constitutions doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's shaped by like political influence, like lobbying, the people, but, like the Supreme Court just, justices who get like applied to interpret these rights are like come from law firms, they have corporate interests, exist in relation to political parties. Why is this the case? The powerful have like an, an active incentive to like make sure these rights are not accountable to the general population. If an active incentive to shape these rights, they're very inflexible and very textual so that they don't protect the things that they should protect. You can see this in like specifics like Roe versus Wade, which got overturned, not because the Supreme Court decided they like abortion, but because of a cause about interstate commerce and privacy, privacy and like states ability to regulate that because the federal restrictions are so hard. I think comparatively, this makes reform much harder and makes applying social justice much harder because these systems get so esoteric. Is this closing? Yeah, Roe versus, Ro versus Wade was also passed because of a right to privacy that was in common. No, it was passed. It wasn't passed due to right to privacy that was enshrined. The right to privacy is an unofficial part of the U.S. Constitution that doesn't exist because it's based upon the Fourth Amendment, which is no unreasonable searches and seizures. The right to privacy could be struck down by the Supreme Court tomorrow because it doesn't accord by the text of the Constitution. It is only based on the full arbitrariness that the Constitution collapses, which I'm going to get to later because your arguments collapse to a theory of justice. But equally, this means that all the symmetrical parts of like the oppression exist on their side because the Constitution can simply be tailored to be as oppressive as possible or to be as not restrictive as possible. We check back, it's either it's easier to get general influence in our society, it's easier to change general ideas in society, and it's easier to shape our conception of justice that exists in relation to precedent. The final thing I wanna deal with here is the comparative, because Ops gonna be like, ah, you can just change everything at will. There are a couple of reasons why a constitution won't change either. One, bigoted courts that interpret it, that internalize the same type of bigotry, to, bigotry that would be applied to theory of justice. Second, a bigoted government that will find ways around it, to circumvent it, like happens all the time with the constitutions. Third, all their mechanisms about society being racist and doing racist stuff applies in either world. If it's not going to be solved by a theory of justice, it won't be solved by rights. Five, those rates have to be interpreted by someone, but that begs the question of their interpretation, and that begs if they're actually written in a way that lends itself to favorable interpretation. Six, and most importantly, the threshold for change and the threshold for changing constitutional rights is far higher than the threshold for changing society's version of justice, which means you can't remove equally messed up constitutional rights that take rights away from minorities because it's much harder to amend the constitution. The fact that it can be changed proves that there's some overarching principle in society, which proves that all their arguments for the constitution being a dead document are complete yes, because we only change it when it's convenient for us, which shows that we should just adopt an overarching principle of justice. Thank the uh, Prime Minister for that speech and the call and the position for the case for all. Is everyone ready? Cool. It is the burden of proof of side government in this debate to show that Supreme Courts are impartial or at least significantly more impartial than governments are. I will show why this is not the case, and in doing that, I will interpret my rebuttal and take opening government and consequentially closing government out of this debate. We have to realize that in a vast range of countries, pretty much all of them, Supreme Courts are heavily politicized. We're not talking just about Poland, where the Law and Justice Party stacked the Supreme Court directly. We're also talking about the fucking United States of America, where Supreme Court justices are directly appointed for their political preferences and survive as activisms of administrations 30 years after that 
administration has been voted out of office. This means that on either side of the house, we have a direct government influence on how this court is going to judge. It's going to be important later, but secondly, not a principal harm before we move on to any of my other arguments. This means that insofar as the right of justice is easier to interpret insofar as it's wider, i.e. different ideologies interpret justice differently, this means that there is a fundamental political injustice being dealt to citizens who go in front of the Supreme Court insofar as they're arbitrarily preferenced or dispreferenced based on the accordance of their ideology with the ideology of the particular judge. Of course, this is not perfect on either side of the house, but the wider the scope of interpretation, the wider the arbitrary preference, therefore, insofar as all citizens should have equal recourse to the state, insofar as they reciprocally give the rights of the state, this is a fundamental principle in justice, which already makes us win this debate. But secondly, on context, though, this debate is not about amazing, lovely countries where the arc of history bends towards justice, because probably people vote in good governments in those countries, and we don't need constitutional oversight. This debate is the more relevant, the more we go into problematic countries. The more problematic the country is, the more people need something to fall back on. In countries where there is corruption, where there are human rights abuses, where there are laws that exclude ethnic groups, where local district courts are corrupt and bribed by local mafia bosses, this is where you need the highest appellate court as a way to challenge the government. Disputes about rights are only relevant when rights are contentious. This is not about me being able to say I love Mary as a friend in this room, because nobody disputes that. It's about me being able to say I love a man in a country that bans homosexuality. In those countries, the status quo is already heavily tipped towards the government, and this is where you need a counterbalancing mechanism. Here's the comparative. In the comparative, we have at least some form of limitation in the sense in which the Constitution is worded. Even in the worst case scenario for us, which is probably the USA is a shit country, they have the right to self-defense enshrined in the Constitution, right to speech enshrined in the Constitution, right to save fair trial and have a corpus, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to just the vague and broad right to justice. How does this work and why? What are the mechanisms as to why it's going to provide better protection to citizens on our, on our side of the house, which we believe is a principal right insofar as the state has disproportionate power over us to legislate and force us to be legislated upon because we cannot resist the state, therefore, mechanisms through the legal system are the only thing and the only recourse we have. Firstly, a constitution which directly gives you state freedom of speech provides you licitation for a particular act, regardless of what people around you think about that. I.e., if the constitution says I have the right to freedom of speech, the current societal atmosphere might be that people don't want me to speak, but there's a paper that tells me that I can, which means it's the burden of proof on the government to take away this right for me. Whereas on their side of the house, we have an amorphous sense of justice, which is dependent on cultural context or just general moral relativity. Because either open government is right and the right of justice this is going to be based on some concrete principles, concrete theories of justice, because as presumably the government of Poland needs to work in on opening government side of the house. If that's correct, then we both agree and we just have more specific rules. Or that's not actually the comparative of the debate, and the way countries shape their constitutions and their sense of justice is based on the particular cultural context at that point in time. The idea of what is just in Afghanistan and Iran vastly differs from what is just in this room. And this where it becomes problematic that justice is amorphous. Whistleblowers, for example, whistleblowers can appeal to the right to freedom of speech has been taken away from me. I spoke and there's a paper that says I can, but on their side because they can't, because the state can say, for the greater good, we think we should ban this, or we think this is not within our definition of justice. Secondly, discourse of inalienability. Bill of Rights do very often directly quote the idea that human rights are inalienable, cannot be taken from the individual, not even by the government. This is a very literalist approach to law that lawyers can only take on their side of the house. But thirdly, know the process of writing constitutions. The majority of this debate happens in post-conflict societies, young countries, post-colonial countries. Due to the urgency of establishing the legal systems and institutions within these countries, what they most often do is they rewrite Western constitutions and bills of rights based upon enlightenment principles which means there is inherently a more uh, a more progressive constitution in place than the current cultural context in countries where this debate is comparative. On their side of the house, that doesn't happen because they don't have a bill of rights in the first place. The constitution creation process on their side of the house is a direct transposition of the current cultural norms. If those norms are good, then the debate is uncomparative. But where they're problematic, the citizens of the recourse towards the state. Fourthly, it's easier on our side for the international community to oversee these things. There's an incentive for them to do that, firstly, because they want to have stable and democratic partners, but also to virtue signal to their own citizens they're protecting democracy. There's also an incentive for countries that are less developed to try to follow these rules and follow these principles because they want to have good relations with more developed countries. However, note the bar. In the status quo, when the Law and Justice Party stacks the Supreme Court, the EU can say, this is a very clear violation of your own constitution, and therefore we can activate the nuclear option. On their side of the house, they don't even have to stack the Supreme Court. They only have to depend on the high likelihood that the random Polish judge appointed to the court is not going to be progressive. Statistically, it's likely he's not, which means there is a less incentive 
for the, for the governments to behave badly on our side of the house, and they have a higher bar. They have to directly stack the court. They can be challenged for that, not just internally, but also by the external community. Before I move on, I'll take a few other proposals. Why would the Constitution, to begin with, be progressive? So first of all, I already explained why most Gandhi's participate is comparative. It's progressive insofar as it's rewritten from other previous examples. But it doesn't have to be just post-conflict societies. Insofar as countries tend to want to join the international community, as a country being created in the first place, right? You want to be recognized by other countries, by international institutions, because you want to have to establish diplomacy. This means you are likely to at least try to pretend optically that you subscribe to their principles, which is why you're going to take uh, uh, inspiration from the US Constitution. I don't know in what take inspiration from the constitution of like, I mean, Croatia, for example. Lastly, precedent is clearer on our side of the house because it's tied to a particular case. In the case of freedom of speech, we shot in this or that way. Whereas on their side of the house, we cannot point to what, the, what element of justice, what part of justice is this exactly about. It's far easier for judges to reinterpret. So precedent is less clear, but also precedent is, here's how this works. Roe versus Wade would be repealed on either side of the house. Because if justice is defined by the people and by the context of society, and people vote on governments that stack courts, then the people that voted for Trump would have at some point in the last 50 years defined justice as being not killing a free born baby. This is an uncomparative debate in the side of the house. What is comparative? It's on our side of the house, governments undertake less egregious abuse because they know it's less likely they can get away with it. There's going to be well-reasoned NGOs challenging them with that. And in five years' time, they're going to have to deal with the optical problem of having the constitutional court take down their law, which can be instrumentalized by the opposition. At the point where they can appeal to justice to avoid that, they're more likely to undertake egregious abuse and harm their citizens' rights. I think opening opposition has already won, and we still have another seven minutes of speaking. Okay, so firstly, some rebuttal for the opening discussion about whether the constitution constitutes something to fall back on for like oppressed minorities in unprogressive societies. And then onto my case, which is probably like, a, which is a direct clash, which is essentially that even if it is hard, a higher burden, People to bring this bring this case to court because they have to show like it's a specific right to, against the right to justice rather than just like some specific right. I think that once they have successfully brought that case in front of the government, it is much harder for the government to then to then um to then like put down to, to put down that case. They are much more likely to agree. You're much more likely to get change and progression. Um, but firstly, on to for my rebuttal. Okay, firstly, this is presupposed, as was pointed out, that the, that the constitution is necessarily liberal. The only reason it really we got for this is that people who people in developing countries who are or people in post-conflict societies are likely to want to copy the West. Okay, a few responses. Firstly, if they want to copy the West, I'm unclear why they wouldn't also want to copy the West when they're like giving judgments in Supreme Courts and creating that kind of precedent, i.e., the people who are writing the constitution are going to be largely similar, have similar motivation to the first people on the Supreme Court of that country. So if they want to like emulate the West, they're going to do this on like on from side of the Supreme Court as well. Right? Secondly, we think that this motivation is large, it, it's not is not necessary or likely, right? We think that very often, like democratic or liberal values are associated with the West, are associated with imperial values. And so in times of conflict, in times where there's a lot of uncertainty, in times especially where there's a lot of urgency and people are scared and people want to hang on to something certain, they are much more likely to revert back to traditional values than just to just go with the West to get like to get some kind of support from a from someone they see who doesn't want to support them anyway, right? And then um, 
Yeah, so that's why the constitution is unlikely to be progressive in the first place, right? Okay, secondly, even if the constitution is progressive, we think fundamentally that it still depends on interpretation, right? We don't think there is a qualitative like difference on either side of the house on like a, on interpretation. It is simply like the amount of interpret inter uh, amount of interpretative freedom that judges have, and they specifically where it comes from, right? We think on our on our side of the house, they have more interpretive freedom at like first, right? But insofar as it has been shown that that this specific right to justice has been violated, they have no choice but to rule in favour of the person bringing. In that case whereas what's the comparative right we think rights very often yeah. conflict and constitutional rights very often conflict and at that point it is much more down to the free again the free the um interpretation of the judge right it's much more down to their like pre to two precedents right so say for, like someone's right to privacy and someone's right to like i don't know um freedom of speech conflict at that point it's very much down to the interpretation of the judge which one's more important right on that but on the but on our side of the house if you can prove that your right to justice has been has been in conflict there is nothing that the judge can weigh against we take the burden that it is harder to prove that your right to justice has been has been like um has been like has been has been violated right we take that burden but we think fundamentally that's a better world than one where the judge has the power to like weigh off the different rights in the constitution why why is this um except at the moment if you say that in situations of urgency, people will default to defining concepts based on their tradition, doesn't it also apply to how they will define justice as per the theory? Okay, yeah, it does, the but we think, we think fundamentally, once you've kind of established, you're likely to move away from that tradition. You're likely to be more open to progress values. Once those grassroots movements in your country have had a chance to come about, the comparative is that even if you start with traditional values on both sides of the house, at least on our side of the house, they're not enshrined in your constitution for like the next 300 years. You can develop, you can change. There is this flexibility okay so on to my case why do we prefer a world in which where the people bringing the case have, the, have like the burden to prove it rather than the judges having the freedom to decide okay Firstly, we think that it is much easier to, to access like greater support at the point of like bringing that case. We think there is a lot of there is a lot of international support at the case of which like there is fair, inter strong international, particularly Western liberal support for a certain case. Right. What what does this look like? This means there is likely to be like when someone's human rights, say, so, say a journalist in the Rana shop, we think there is there is generally a fair amount of national support, international support in Groundswell, i.e. there is a lot of backing for this type of like resources you need to prove this case. This looks like things like funding. This looks like things like research. This looks like things like lots and lots of journalists going about and asking the right questions and getting that evidence. And more, moreover, it isn't just about like funding and hard resources. It is simply, it is also about the kind of like moral spirit and like and motivation behind it, right? You don't feel like you're on your own when you have this kind of groundswell of, of, of opinion. Secondly, we think it's much more sympathetic, i.e. you're going to have a lot more support domestically in proving your claim, even if, if you're like, so say you're like a minority, and most of the kind of elites and middle class aren't going to particularly feel sympathetic. They're going to be fairly detached from your claim like you're bringing against the court, right? What's the comparative here? Okay, on their side, there are competing rights that the government, is, that people have to weigh off, i.e. it's much easier for like the people who may support the minority or may go the government's way to go the government's way when they are faced with excessive propaganda and funding against that right, right, because they have their thing to say, oh, I'm moral, I think there's like this other right which I think is more important, right, but what's the comparative here, right, um, if if there if you don't have this competing rights, if you have this recognition of right to justice, that things conflict, but that means that there is there is generally a right answer, but you just have to prove it. At the point at which you can prove it, then you're much more likely to get that sympathy from them. You're much more likely to get that groundswell of support that you wouldn't otherwise, because those people who are morally like um who are ambivalent are much more likely to feel sympathetic to your cause. And why is this so important? Right? Because we think in many countries, many countries, many, many countries with like bigoted governments, with oppressive governments, we think that they they have to co-opt that middle class or that upper middle class, right? And we don't think that those those people are necessarily but absolutely in support of the government. We think they are often fairly reasonably self-interested. We think they like care about keeping them, themselves, they see keeping themselves like um keeping themselves in a good position, like economically and politically, they care about keeping that country like fairly running quite well. So if they think that the government is like able to squash them, if they think it's probably reasonably morally right and they are able to ignore it, they are likely to go that way. But if they don't think so, if they are, if they think that, um, 
if they if they um if they think it is wrong they are much more likely to be persuaded to start vocalizing support for such movements right and what does this mean this doesn't have to be a lot because we think that oppressive governments generally will will kind of will make concessions because it's quite expensive to like oppress people it's quite hard so if you have this kind of support group molding then you're much likely to get this change thank you i'd like to have my speech there <laughs> I find it interesting that opening government seems to think that the fact that on our side of the house, a judge is going to have to be the one trading off various rights is somehow an argument for their side of the house. I do not think Tin could have been any clearer that in situations where it is very obvious which party is wrong and which party is in the right, which party has a claim and which one does not, on both sides of the house, the process is going to look quite similar. Tin has been also crystal clear that the reason why we believe the Bill of Rights is important is because that rights should be upheld and should be relevant even in cases where that does not turn out to be the most important right. And I think this is the crux of the debate because yes, Opening government is right. On our side of the house, what happens is the judge trades off two different rights. On their side of the on our side of the house, the verdict is going to be something along the lines of in this particular case, one right trumps the other because you have to decide one way or the other. However, that does not eliminate the fact that the right that does not come out on top is still a right that exists and should be respected. In practice, that's most often going to look like something like if you have to pay damages, maybe you pay less damages. If you still get convicted for manslaughter, maybe we acknowledge that it was self-defense. And even though you technically did still kill someone, we want people to feel moving forward, still feel comfortable to act in self-defense because that is something that they have the right to, even if that right does not protect them from all consequences in all cases. What happens is that moving forward, you can keep relying on that right even if that right is not a get out, of, get out of jail free card. But secondly, it also probably means in practice, you get some sort of reparations, minimized punishment, whatever. On side government, what they have to stand for is that you don't have a verdict that acknowledges two sides both had the right to something, but someone has to come out on top. There is one sense of justice that has to be defined and one thing has to be just and the other one has to be unjust because otherwise it doesn't make a fucking difference whether you appeal to justice or to rights, right? So if the problem of government is that rights are too unspecific, that's just ridiculous because they want to rely on precedent entirely. It's so much easier to argue that whatever precedents have been set all do not apply to this case on what is justice because there is one detail that maybe matters that changes the understanding of justice, that changes the nuance of the social context in which this happens, that then might mean the justice might look differently in this case versus the others. It's much easier to rely on rights that are inalienable, that have very established precedents, where those rights are something you can rely on even in cases where maybe they're not the most important thing. So to the extent that we care about protecting people, we should care about giving them one, the avenue in which they can re rely, the, they most reliably can have rights that will be acknowledged in courts as valuable regardless of the outcome, but also to where they feel that those have the rights. And I'm gonna deal with that later in more depth, right? But also like OG said like, ah, but courts want to maintain objectivity. Like if that is the case, that's gonna be the case on both sides of the house and there's no point in changing anything, right? Because if courts want to maintain objectivity and uh, be fair to everyone, they're also uphold the bill of rights in a fair way. But also 
here's the thing, gun rights are upheld in the US, not because of, you know, it's a right that's inalienable. You can still change the Bill of Rights, right? Probably, uh, uh, you would even be able to do that. The problem is that you have very, very powerful gun lobbies and that everything that is up for debate in the US rather than something that is enshrined is politicized as fuck to the point of becoming dysfunctional, right? So on the idea of like um, uh, institutionalizing oppression, uh, which is somehow uh, so something that OG thinks goes for them, I'm unsure how having a very, very clear view that is very, like, I think everyone in the US knows what is in the Bill of Rights. I think if something really ridiculous would be in there, they would, that would probably end up being changed because society would not stand for it, right? Good luck scrutinizing every single fucking precedent that a court might rely on from the last, I don't know how many, at least 300 years, right? And good luck having si most citizens doing it. Like, most citizens don't even know the majority of cases in front of the Supreme Court. I'm unsure why at the moment where the majority of the decisions enforced in the legal courts are going to be to things like amorphous, vague uh, precedents that are being set where someone is going to be able to scrutinize that. What is the burden of proof? Because OG seems to think it's easier to change society. It's not about what society thinks because we don't have I hate to go for the buzzword, but we don't have epistemic access of an aggregated view of the entirety of society and not just their, their general view, but also the nuances in each specific situation of the, what they would prefer, which means that what we go on is not like the general what society wants and society tends to tend to be being progressive, but how society expresses that. How does it express it? Oh, wait, through things like whoever has the strongest and the loud, loudest lobby is going to win. There's probably a majority of society in the US who wants abortion rights and thinks that probably women should have autonomy of their, over their body. It's just that the people trying to, to, to get rid of abortion are louder, have much money, have much political power. The more things are up for debate in this way, the worse the race to the bottom of politicizing everything, grabbing power, disenfranchising minorities from voting, all of the things get, because the more you have to gain if you do those things. The more you have these incentives, the more money gets into politics. So the harder it is for you to reach a threshold where you can pump enough money into the liberal closet for you to be able to match the Koch brothers or Elon Musk or whoever the fuck is pushing dumb shit, right? I've already talked about how people can't be expected to follow every single case that is going to happen. So whatever reliance you want to have on public scrutiny gets a million times worse when it relies entirely on precedents where you might have to know a hundred precedents to decide which one of them is going to be more likely this particular uh, interpretation of justice than just this right is inalienable. How do we trade it on with something closing? Uh, most of the basic rights you're talking about are something quite intuitive, and most people agree with that. Why is it like? Yeah, look, 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 look. Tina has made it clear that if something is super intuitive and uncontested, it's probably going to be uncontested on both sides of the house. However, things like do we care about whistleblowers or is this something that endangers uh, national security? Is something that comes up relatively often every few years, right? That's the kind of thing where I'm unsure why courts and the government would give a shit about uh, the, the justice right of one individual to be able to spill state secrets that they claim are horrendous, unless there is something that forces them to acknowledge that no matter the situation, you have a right to whistleblower free speech or whatever it is. Second, process matters. I've already touched upon why, how things are perceived definitely influences the amount of scrutiny that can exist, right? I, I come from a vaguely functional democracy in Romania and still because of the fact that there's an expectation that uh, uh, policemen are going to be corrupt and that courts are going to be corrupt. If you go against someone with money, you don't even bother with it, right? We see that happening even in the US where women don't re really bother going after sexual assault cases if they don't think they can win. On their side of the house, not only do you have the problem that in the contested things where people of color already don't trust police, don't trust putting the decision in the hands of the state, but on top of the fact that you have a high burden of proof, you not only need to prove what happened, you also need to prove that is justice. That makes it harder for everyone. It makes it worse for all human rights, proud to oppose. <laughs> I did not get to anything
told you, see when you play my bug on the roads, I'm going to sound you here because spoiler alert, I'm running a principle. Uh, starting in three, two, one. Constitutional rights are a measure of last resort when the state and its tyranny have oppressed you. Meaning, for you to be able to challenge them to defend yourself, you have to go outside of the confines of the state. You cannot use that when individual rights are the qualified way in which the state persists for right. I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, qualifications on why a lot of all is out of this debate. Secondly, why institutions uh, like constitutions are not progressive, not changing. And thirdly, the principle. Now, three qualifications that take opening opposition out of this debate. Firstly, constitutions are uh, constitutional courts are a measure of last resort. They're not local courts and they're not local legislations about you not stealing, not killing people, not intruding on their private property. They're taken in way, ways in which, firstly, it's an affront to your very humanity, or secondly, class action lawsuits in which the whole society is affected. For, for, for example, rights of my, minority communities that have been systematically disoppressed. Secondly, there's a massive difference between a case in the constitutional court and in local courts. Like, firstly, very fewer cases, not so much time pressure, and you have much more time to make a decision. This is why decisions take multiple weeks. Secondly, you have to do an extensive report on why you have done this, and you have to justify every single thing that you have actively done. Thirdly, it's not a random the Polish judge that is taking that decision, it is multiple constitutional judges that are firstly, supposedly the most qualified within society, secondly, have much more public pressure and scrutiny because those are class action lawsuits and there's a massive pressure for them to be objective, or thirdly, they have different biases which cancel themselves out, or at least just this necessity for them to justify themselves to one another. Meaning there's a massive difference between yes. random Polish bias judges in cases and constitutional judges, constitutional judges that take a few decisions a year at most, are have extensive amounts of time to do them and have massive public scrutiny outside of okay. this. Now, later. Now, why does the constitution, why is the constitution firstly inherently wrong in many cases? I would say there are a lot of issues that are supposed to be, that are supposed to be individual rights that are currently not qualified. In many countries, this is abortion, gay rights, reparative rights for indigenous communities, or for example, positive, positive rights. For example, the right to UBI, the right to social welfare, the right to education. Like there isn't, by the way, an individual, individual right to food in America, even though this is supposed to be very progressive. This is so because firstly, previously, there was a bigger asymmetry between the people and the state, and the state wanted to perpetuate its power. But secondly, because certain social issues that exist today just didn't exist or were massively oppressed previously. For example, women. I would say that the list nuanced. In some cases, they exist to some way, but are presented through the lens of the, 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 the previous people that were dominating society. For example, in Bulgaria, you have the right to marriage, right? But the right to marriage is codified as the right between a man and a woman to marry, meaning they either don't exist or are codified in specific ways that necessarily oppress. Right. Secondly, why even if society is changing, something that already doesn't prove, the Qualification within the constitution doesn't change. I'll take it five. So, multiple reasons as to why this is the case. The first of which, in many cases, those are minority issues, which means that if parties are inherently majoritarian, it's not a pressing issue for them. The second reason is that in many cases, there's an insufficient amount of political capital for you to do this. Why is that the case? Because many in many parliaments, in liberal democracies, for example, or in developing nations, there is a lot of polarization. You don't have a secure majority. Secondly, you have a finite amount of political favors, which means you want to prioritize other things. Or thirdly, in many cases, there are much more pressing things for you to have to extensively do. For example, the, 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 fixing the economy, legislation on healthcare or education, instead of focusing on constitutional rights, which means in the vast majority of cases, it is unfeasible. But secondly, it is very problematic for you to change the constitution because, firstly, in many cases, the constitution is massively glorified. That is, for example, the American constitution, in which whenever you want to change something, it triggers right wing arguments about it being a slippery slope. They're going to change this right, then they're going to change the second right. Or secondly, it triggers the psychological fallacy of people to be risk averse, to be resistant, to be resistant to change, which generally means that you have insufficient social and political capital, even if it is necessary. This is why this policy is necessary. Finally, Let's get to the point. Sure. Let's talk about the principle. We completely agree with opening opposition in that there are different moral and cultural contexts. They say that they exist. They never just they never justify as to why we have to actively ignore them altogether. I would posit two claims. The first of which is that morality is inherently subjective. Not only does it change over time, but it changes on a cultural to cultural basis and on individual to individual basis. Why is this trivially true? Because people have different moral intuitions, people have different lived experiences, people live in different environments, which generally means that 
if we don't have like uh, what was the famous CPA word, epistemic access to the preferences of other people, and we all have our own moral individual perceptions, this necessarily means that morality is inherently subjective. Sure, we reach some conclusions and qualify them, but they're necessarily qualified by, by people with their own irrational, subjective perceptions of what morality ought to be. I'll take you later on. Meaning that in some cases, some people believe that right to having a gun is a right to self-defense. Other believe it is not right because it infringes upon the consent of people not to be violently attacked. Secondly, many people believe that the taxation is theft. Other people actively believe that they're entitled to that because it's the prerequisite to them to be Polish, and this is why they should have UBI and social welfare, which means clashes on rights are inherently subjective. What is the issue in the status quo? The state mandates what is not a right and what isn't a right, which means that firstly, it is a blanket policy that is homogenized as morality or whatever the fancy word is again. Uh, and secondly, it is a top down approach. It's not a bottom up approach, meaning what the state imposes as a right is retained as a right. We massively change this because every single person, if you have a different conception of what morality is, if it is crucial to their self flourishing, for example, the capacity for you to collectivize with other people to protect your indigenous rights, necessarily means they can exercise their right to what, to what a good life is, but also to defend themselves against the state. Uh, before I continue, I'll take a point from Omelik. Yes. Maria's POI to Mary explicitly suggests that the values we converge upon are quite intuitive, which makes your principle relatively uncomparative, but is also a very good mechanism as to why the Bill of Rights will be reasonable on our side. Then what becomes comparative are the five mechanisms where it's easier to make your case on our side, therefore fulfilling your moral prerogative. In your side, in some cases, in, 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 in your side, in all cases, judges don't defer to subjective interpretations of morality because they care for their legal career. In our side, even if they're engraved social rights, at least you have the merit of an argument that could persuade some justice. The asymmetry is not huge because, let's be fair, this debate is about two cases a year, but at least it exists. But secondly, I don't care. The principle is it, it exists regardless of practical considerations, and this is why it's important. Secondly, let's talk about state power, like this is favorite argument. If we believe that the right to change the government and to control the government is prior to everything else because you don't consent to the government because it has asymmetrically more power to you, then this necessarily means that we must give you the tools to control that state. The problem is in the status quo, the, true, the tools to which you control it are state-defined, right? The state defined what morality is and what individual right exists, meaning irrespective of practical considerations, you should give you the tools to defend yourself, to defend your own perception of morality. And here I want to give a very, very like, uh, okay, intuitional part. Any you in the status quo, you cannot you can vote for whatever candidate you want, right? You can just write an empty ballot. You can write for whatever policy you want. You are not confined by specific economical and political policies or by specific candidates. Meaning you're given the freedom, even if it's not necessary. On all those grounds, are proposed. <laughs> Okay, one point of miscellaneous extra level to closing government, and then I'm going to spend the vast majority of my speech on the extension. So first they say that effectively we don't have enough political capital to implement rights, and then they give a lot of mechanism as to why it's difficult to amend these types of Bill of Rights over time, uh, etc. The first observation I make is that if the population doesn't have the political capital to amend something in the Bill of Rights, then probably it isn't a strong enough democratic belief of that population to actually implement it in the Bill of Rights. It's totally unclear on what values they're saying, like why you're going to get like all of these really, really nice changes. And B, speaking of really nice changes, I don't think they've proven that justices are going to be changing good things on net, um, other than saying that like elite judges in Poland are particularly well educated and that seems nice. I don't think they respond to the characterization that these judges are not democratic, that they might be subject to regulatory or to capture from political parties, like in the United States, where you have super conservative judges passing awesome, uh, like terrible things, right? Um, I think that's the main point. And then like all of the other things I have in terms of democracy are going to clash with that relatively directly. Uh, the first thing I want to extend on is 
trust in institutions and why this is so important and why a right to justice would erode the trust in the institutions as opposed to a codified bill of rights. Why is that? The first thing to note here is that people are going to perceive this right to justice as less democratic than a bill of rights. Why is that the case? A, they literally just are, right? Like note that when you have a bill of rights that was voted on by a, like a large body of people when they were making this type of constitution, right? Uh, these are people that are more accurately reflecting the democratic will. You can vote on the individual laws. You can vote to amend these types of laws as opposed to in the other type of system, you don't have influence over those judges beyond like a very highly removed democratic process where maybe you can nominate those judges over time. It's significantly less democratic in actuality. And as a result, people have the ability to see that. But secondly, note that rights enshrined in the Supreme Court are inscrutable and unclear when they are under one umbrella of justice. For example, in a public conversation, I can point to the right, the fact that I have the freedom of speech or the right to bear arms versus if we only have the right to justice, then I say, actually, in Johnson versus Ferguson, 1932, uh, the Supreme Court justices enshrined this as an interpretation of our right to justice, and thereby, I think I have access to this thing, right? It's far less tangible for the average person in order to grip it when they're having these types of conversations, and then see it's less representative, right? So we are you picking out the most educated elite people in power of society and giving them comparatively more democratic power. Okay, note, these aren't minor concerns, right? So if you say, oh, like a court changes, does this really like fundamentally radically view people's change and how they perceive themselves, their states and accessing their rights? Yes, we're talking about fundamental rights, which people are talking about here. We're talking about in every single political debate, when you go on TV and they say freedom of speech, right to a fair trial, this dominates your political discourse and informs conception of yourself as a citizen and what types of things are possible in the realm of public discourse. One final thing to say about this point, even if they say, ah, but we're doing this as a wood motion and probably like in weird meta debate rules, that means that there's probably some sort of like debate, uh, like society wide context when you go into this, even if you have wood fiat right now, you don't have it into the future and it's unclear why you're going to have it into the future given these mechanisms that I've just given you. What are the impacts of this? That happens in a few main respects. The first of which is political polarization and radicalization that occurs when people don't believe that they are represented by their states. So first of all, note that we already have seen trends of this in the status quo with things like Italy, France, etc. It's totally unclear that we are going to like be able to avoid this long term. But uh, note that these types of like especially right wing narratives, but also left wing narratives are uniquely empowered by elite capture narratives which are only further supported by this type of uh, motion. The impact of this is that that's obviously bad for the implementation of rights or like like radical, bad uh, extremist policy, which tramples over the rights of minorities, right? Which, by the way, can happen independent of things, like outside of the court, right? So you can not only pass laws, which are particularly restrictive, but also in terms of people's overall perception towards minorities, but also like independent of actual conception, um, independent of actual conceptions, we think it's like uh, not, not democratic, right? Um, but also note that it's like much slower to act if there's a political disagreement at the point where you have a higher amount of polarization and disagreement in society, i.e. a lot of situations are kind of like value neutral in the sense that if you just need to build roads and build healthcare relatively quickly or respond to a type of crisis or respond to a war, we have more effective on the comparative political machinery at the point where you have buy-in. But B, note that this isn't just like super developed countries. We're also talking about nascent states where like democracy as a whole and the faith in democratic institutions is really, really, really important. And you want to get people to buy into these. And it's extraordinarily risky at the point where you don't have buy-in into that political project and we could get authoritarian backsliding in these type of states. That's another massive impact. They're potentially disenfranchising people if there's authoritarian backsliding. But see, finally, trust in society to begin with. That is to say, you need to believe in your institutions and the court. Uh, you're more likely to pay taxes. You're less likely to be corrupt. You get more civil engagement. This is good for society as a whole, right? And note that that empowers the rights of democracies and make it so that people have better lives. Well, Secondly, I want to expand on democracy as a principle, because I think Tin gives this nice state power principle, and I think it's valid and fair in the room, but it's unclear why like the courts specifically are insufficient to protect your rights against uh, the state, right? What we actually need in this debate is a prioritization of why we need to maximize democratic participation in the court system, right? Right. Um, and, and so it, it doesn't go far enough, right? It's it's valid, but what you need to do is actually show why democracy in itself is good. Why is that? A, because people express their preferences their best, and everyone has their own conception of what their good of what the good life is, right? We don't know that. But B, um, and we can't judge between the value of people, right? So we have to assume that everyone is roughly equal because everyone has their own what unique experiences and life uh, uh, events that they're drawing from. And given the fact that we can't meaningfully decide between those two, we should prioritize to giving everyone a 
a vote and expressing their own preferences. And when we do that, it's much better that we prioritize a system uh, where people have more direct control over the types of rights which are made, as opposed to a highly arbitrary rights to justice uh, uh, system, which is actually what uh, uh, CO is arguing for despite knocking. Finally, at this point about like the long arc of history, right? So we get this point from OO where they say, these are nice because they're modeled after Western constitutions and like post-conflict states. Here's additional analysis. A, when constitutions are made, there are unique historical circumstances of constitution, like it's a constitutional movement. That is to say, you need buy-in from all parties, right? So even if your country uh, is, is relatively new and has a majority group, you still don't want to have a separatist group, particularly like regional separatist groups, which is why we often have a huge amount of concessions and overall like fine treatment of everyone in society in order to get the buy-in, in order to get the first level of the Constitution to happen. B, you have some sense of political unity and optimism of making an equitable new society, right? And no, if you can't just brush this off by saying like narratives aren't important, narratives are incredibly important in terms of influencing action. See every single school curriculum debate in post-conflict societies because the beliefs that people have inform what they do. But C, even if it's not objectively good, they are minimally democratic enough that they reflect the will of the people in order to get enough buy-in at the time that they are created. D, finally, we say that rights most of the times are protection from what the governments can do. They are not actively oppressive. They guarantee freedoms, and that's worth protecting. Please. So I think the stream stopped, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think it is. Oh, oh no, no, that's really like the the videos so you guys would hear yourself. It's ah, okay, okay, sorry. I, I just wanted to make sure. Oh, okay. oh, I didn't put this here so you don't see yourself. Okay. 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 NRA. Three, two, one. I think what their argument essentially says is, oh, this society will not perceive this as an actual protection of rights, therefore people distrust the government or do not feel represented. I want to plot a few things. Firstly, note that they already say that it's uh, basically it's hard to amend those constitutions. It's like if people are not strong enough to change those laws, then the laws probably should not exist. But this is fucking ridiculous. We already proved to you that there are literal constraints in terms of the bureaucracy that occurs for you to be able to change those laws. AK, okay, firstly, there are a lot of requirements for you to be able to call the Supreme Court to be able to change a certain constitution. The reason for this is exactly because of what they plotted. Constitutions are glorified to an extent that it's believed that they shouldn't be meant that way. Secondly, though people not very regularly stick to the text in particular why because they glorify for example the founding fathers that created their country and protected their liberty and did all those things and so they're inherently very like uh, protect the text the same way religious people are stick to the text of like the bible but why is this extremely harmful is the reason that people are very risk averse in changing those constitutions because they deem it as something that will change the morals of their whole country or generally that they seem as something that's morally wrong since you believe those founding fathers and what society should exhibit in most Part. However, though, I think the last thing that we need to rebut is that inherently, even if people are willing to do this in a very litigation, very lengthy process that are often not able to occur for thousands of years, even if societal opinion supports it. The reason why Black people are not able to vote for such a society supported it was because of the litigation that you have to go through. And all, for example, for you to oh, rebut the previous constitution and then prove the legitimacy of the new thing that you want to support. I think this is inherently more unaccessible to most people in the case that you believe this. But secondly, I would they say, oh, you don't feel represented. I would say only two things. One, if all people and all 
their rights are presented by this notion that supposedly all people would presume to be believe it as true. It's not as if some people are just going to have the right to justice and other won't have the basic cool rights that opposition wants to talk about. I think this generally shifts the perception that people have of rights in the status quo. But secondly, though, I am not sure why this is something more important than what pre previously proved. Because what we do essentially say is that the morals of society change over time. The reason why we are okay with having a state limiting our individual rights is because we supposedly have a state of uh, like power to recourse against them or that generally we can express what we believe to be morally true. Laws are created to create, to follow the current moral views of society. And if those moral views are something that we are able to change more effectively, that is presupposably oh, no. more important as it allows more people to access the dignity of uh, controlling what happens in their life on an everyday basis. This is far more important than a few people not distrusting the government in a way that I'm not sure what will actually happen. Now, Secondly, on uh, opening opposition, I want to posit a few things here. First thing, will the constitution be done well? I think what they're only announcing is, oh, you follow the West because you want to join our international organization. This is something that you do. One, not that those constitutions most of the time are followed by very old versions of the Western institutions. They don't mean most of the Balkans have followed the Belgian constitution, but they won't in the 1850s. That was why constitutions were still conservative. The only difference is, though, that the West has continued to change its constitution. The Balkans and all other regions haven't because they're very risk averse and are likely to have problematic virtues. But secondly, no judges are very vague. And if judges are as bad as they want to prove to you, then judges can interpret the vagueness in a way that supports them. I think this is fairly symmetrical. And thirdly, though, what I asked in my view are is that some rights are quite important you should have, whether it is maybe you should have right to privacy or you should have control over your life. However, this debate is about the rights that are not intuitive to most people and that are dependent on the kind of moral relativity that, that you talk about. Not me and yourself say, look, in some times, more is not, is universally presumed to be not okay. But in some cases, we are okay with not because the more creativity that you allow right now is something very important. The ability for you to go into the court and ask to protect the right that was maybe deemed by people to be something that you do not deserve, such as to be excused of murder because you have to act in self-defense, is something that's extremely important for the most boring people that do have any protection in that regard. Look, it's hard to change constitution, but even harder to understand and change entire web of precedents, despite people in Croatia changing the constitution to define uh, marriage as men and a woman. People distrusting the government means that even if you get a better system, they don't profit from it because they don't trust the court to go. Okay, but they don't distrust it right now when something that they deem as their individual right is not within the constitution. And if you actively annihilate it and disregard it from society in a way that doesn't allow them to access the goods of life that you suppose. Now, let's deal with specific instances. One, they say you have better protection of rights, and I want to, uh, to ask a few things. Well, why is it likely that the society that they talk about will disregard the most basic rights in the way people? I'm not sure why most people don't believe in the right to privacy. I'm not sure why they will interpret in that sort of a bad way. What this says then is, ah, there are certain rights that should always be followed no matter if society believes in them. I think for the ones that are very always how to be followed or something that will do this regardless. But what we even say on our side is better because if you have to trade off against certain rights, maybe not being reflected. I think that's fine because we've continued to have so far as we are able to control with our own views. To put our laws are supposed to reflect people's morals at that time. And if the morals of those people do not reflect that currently, we believe this is justified because it's the only way for people to be able to access all the dignity and free will that they're supposedly having in that regard. You consent to the state so far as you are still able to control your self-dignity and the way you live your life. Lastly, though, I want to just rebut on a few things about why judges are not as bad. I think, firstly, most of them, as Mr. said, are likely going to be the most educated ones. But secondly, there were likely the people who could have escaped the bad regimes and that go to the West, get educated, and have certainly good views. The problem right now is that even if they want to vote in your favor, they cannot. For example, if they want to vote for gay marriage, they cannot. Because both of you say a man and a woman, and you're actively prohibited from being change the constitutions by the shitty constitutions that you have. Lastly, on uh, on our openings, I think 
democracy, the what we mechanize better than them is the white constitutions that are unlikely to change or very hard to change in a way that it's hard for people to access their rights and the things that they deem morally important. But secondly, I think we far better prove the principle as to what if you have certain perception of what is morally correct and what is something that you as a person have a right to, then you should have the ability to defend this even if you do not succeed because it's a way for you to actively either provoke a discussion about this topic or secondly, at least have the validation that you try to protect something that you deem morally important to you. I think it's far important, uh, more important in the way that if you do not currently are able to exercise your perception of what is morally right and what you should have as a right in your life, then this is something far more important than how big it impacts you. Very a self speech for that. Both of us. Is it possible to move this in some way? We don't have enough space here. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit. Uh... Ready? Throughout the entirety of the Second World War and like the Nazi regime in Germany, the constitution that was officially in, for, in power was the constitution of the Weimar Republic that gave like legal protections such as freedom of speech and association. Obviously, those were not followed in that time period. What is the point I'm making here? What is written in a constitution is not as relevant as what people are buying into and the rights that people believe exist in the state. And that is where our extension comes in, right? We're saying is, uh, to first of all, one piece of framing and why that makes our, our extension the most impactful thing in this debate, because it does, this debate is not about specific legal decisions for individual people, but what people perceive to be the rights that are in the constitution and a lot of direct rebuttal in comparison to the other issues. Look, framing. Constitutional cases take like forever, right? Constitutional cases are, are, are usually like regress once something has already happened. The Roe in Roe versus Wade never actually got the abortion that she fought the case for, because by the time the decision was made, she had already given birth, right? What does this mean? This means I think this debate is not necessarily about the things that happen in the courtroom specifically and whether people specifically can be like, can be given right or wrong in the court. I think this particular thing about this debate is what Brayden talks about, is where people buy into rights existing and rights being a thing, and therefore changing the understanding of morality we have in the society at large, and having public appeal to certain to these certain rights, right? Um, we talk about um, opening government. Let's start with opening government. We do this chronologically. Opening government say two main things. First of all, this right of justice is more responsive to societal movements and changes of the opinions in society. Four responses to that. First of all, this assumes that constitutions move incredibly slowly and is largely based on the idea that the United States Constitution never, like, barely ever changes. The reason why this is the case is because the United States Constitution is one of the most terribly designed political documents in the world. Like, I can literally just counter example and say, like, Switzerland changes its constitution about three times a year, Ireland does it every few years. I don't understand why that's true, well, right? Then, no, thank you. But then B, we think 
judges are less likely to follow societal movements because judges are generally decoupled from society to a certain extent, right? Judges usually uh, are not as much in a public focus. Judges usually don't face re-election pressures. Therefore, they have fewer incentives to actually go along with, pop with like popular opinion. I think an activist judge that has a certain ideology is much more likely to be ruling with little accountability than like a whole political body that can change a constitution. Thirdly, but again, like emergency cases where a constitution and public opinion are really decoupled, that still gets addressed in our side of the house, right? Like Brayton tells you in his POI2 opening off about how like Roe v. Wade was constructed on like multiple interpretations of the constitution. That can still happen in our side of the house if it's genuinely so hard to change that constitution. Thirdly, but, uh, fourthly, sorry, I think we flip this point. We're saying that when we have this point of uh, this discussions about changing constitution, these rights are like elaborated more uh, in the public discussion and more of a through the democratic process. You have more buy-in, you have more acceptance, um, and more, more acceptance of these societal movements on the legal sphere. Uh, I'll take you in a second. Um, then the second thing they say is you get better justice for minorities in particular. They assume that this justice ideal is more objective than the Bill of Rights. We don't understand why, right? By their own acceptance from the DPM, it's usually a trade-off of rights. It's completely unclear why in a situation where both people are claiming their justice has been violated in a certain way, they're going yeah. to rule in favor of the minority, right? And again, when someone is saying that their justice has been violated because they have been like exploited un un against the law, and someone says that their justice has been violated because they haven't been able to like follow economic freedom. We don't know why a judge is not just going to sign with the economic freedom argument, right? But then um finally we also just think that um it's easy, even if it's true that you get worse, uh even if it's true that you get worse that you get better results in the courtroom specifically. We don't necessarily think this matters when it's unlikely to be pushed on like a more broader scale and not an enumerated right you can point to and create public pressure outside the court of saying, I should have this right to freedom of speech. I should have this right to freedom of assembly. I should have this right to whatever right it is, because we think that when this is the case, it's more likely that it's just going to be ignored in the broader population, right? Because most people cannot constantly litigate because like going to the courts is really expensive and takes a lot of time. That means a lot of people, even if the court might rule in their favor if they were to go to the court, might still just abstain from doing things that are contentious because they don't know whether the courts are going to rule in their favor. And therefore, people are still not going to dare to exercise their freedom of speech when they don't know for sure whether they will actually have the backing of the court. Now I'll take over. Yeah, under Robish's point, it was struck down because with my new constitutional textualist details. This seems to prove our point that instead it should be endorsing general societal rights to be understand that abortion is okay because the constitution can't protect these things. I'm completely unsure why like six Republican justices that all voted for striking down Roe vs. Wade would rule in favor of abortion near side of house and you never explained why they would. All right, moving on to closing government. Laws in government tell me that laws should reflect morality of society, and laws and rights should reflect in the like morality of society and like the moral subjectivity of society. I'm very, very unclear why that is a point in favor of those things being decided relatively arbitrarily by a judge rather than by a political process that involves multiple members of society and basically as many people as possible. Right? We completely agree with this characterization as principle. We think that Brayton gives you a lot of analysis of why when you have democratic uh, democratic um, processes, sorry, English hard. When you have democratic processes that are going to be, um, that are enshrining constitutional rights through deliberation and discussion in the whole of society, you're much more likely to actually reflect all of society in that process, right? Whereas on their side of the house, it's much more likely that judges are going to decide in a somewhat biased way because by it, because judges are more likely to come from like the same groups of society because only certain groups of society are likely to actually like go to law school and make a massive legal career. Even if you're not from these groups, once you are going through this process, you probably have assimilated to being more upper class, to being more educated, etc. Therefore, I think it's more likely that the vast array of moral viewpoints is acknowledged when you have this democratic process in place. Finally, weighs up against opening opposition. We think that, first of all, they're talking about these troubled states, right? We think in these cases, particularly, it is probably not that important what the decision in the courtroom is going to be, because even if, like, a judge is going to say, yeah, you by the Constitution actually do have a right to be gay, that probably does not stop the average conservative Polish person that it characterized from being homophobic towards you, right? I think it's unclear why in a situation where you don't have that buy-in, that only brain analyzes why it happens more on our side of the house, 
people are actually going to like respect your rights rather than still just tread on them and hope they don't get litigated against. Try to propose. Can the uh, and then move out of the room. So, the uh, the best of the best of Thanks for watching. LSC open. Yay!